الحمد للہ و صلاۃ وسلام علی رسول اللہ و اعلیٰ علی صاب اجمعین اما بعد اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم کل یا ہل الکتاب تعال و علاقل میں تین سوا ام بن نبی نقم اللہ نقد اللہ ولا نشرق بھی ہی شیوں ولا یت خزباد نباد دن اربا بن من دن اللہ فن تول فقول شدو بینا مسلمون رب شہلی صدری و یسر علی عمری و حل العقد تمل ثانی یف کا حکولی مائی ریسپیکٹ ریلڈرس اینڈ مائی ڈیئر بردرز اینڈ سسٹرس آئی ویلکم آل آف یو ود اسلامک گریٹنگز السلام علیکم و رحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ میں پیس مرسی اینڈ بلیسنگز آف اللہ سبحان و تعالی آف آل مائی گاڈ بی آن آل آف یو The topic of this evening's talk is similarities between Hinduism and Islam. I started my talk by quoting a verse from the Glorious Quran from Surah Al Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 64, which says, Kul, ya hilal kitab, say, O people of the book, Ta'ala ila kalmatin sawa im bayna baynakum, come to common terms as between us and you. Which is the first term? Allah, na'buda illallah. That we worship none but one Almighty God. Wala nushrika bihi shayyam. That we associate no partners with Him. Wala yattakhiza baad dun abad dan arbaban min dun illa. That we erect not among ourselves lords and patrons other than Allah. Fain tawallahu. If then they turn back. Fakul lushadu. Say ibe witness. Biyanna muslimun. That we are Muslims bowing our will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This verse, though it specifically refers to the Ahle Kitab, to the Jews and Christians, in general, it can be used for people of different faiths. And according to me, it is the best verse that can be used while speaking with different kinds of people. It says, Come to common terms as between us and you. Which is the first term? Allah, na'buda illallah. That we worship none but one almighty God. Wala nushrika bihi shayyam. That we associate no partners with him. Wala yattakhiza baad dun abad dan arbaban min dun illa. That we erect not among ourselves lords and patrons other than one almighty God. It is not appropriate to try and understand a particular religion by trying to observe the followers of that religion. Because many a times, the followers, they themselves are not aware about the teaching of their religion. Therefore, the best and the most appropriate method of trying to understand any religion is to try to understand the authentic sources of that religion, the authentic scriptures of that religion. If you have to understand Hinduism, you have to try and understand the sacred scriptures of Hinduism. The most sacred are the Vedas. And the shlokas were recited from these scriptures. That is supplemented by the Upanishads, by the Ithiyas, Ramayana, Mahabharata, Bhagavad Gita, by the Puranas, Manusmriti, etc. But the most sacred are the Vedas amongst all the Hindu scriptures. So if you have to understand Hinduism, you have to try and understand the sacred scriptures of Hinduism. Similarly, in Islam, the most sacred scripture is the glorious Quran. which is the last and final revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of Almighty God which was revealed to the last and final messenger Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. It is supplemented with the authentic ahadith, the sayings and the traditions of Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. So if you have to understand Islam, you have to try and understand the glorious Quran and the authentic hadith of the Prophet. I would like to give the definitions of Islam the word Hinduism and Islam. Let's understand the definition of the word Hindu. Hindu is a geographical definition which refers to the people living beyond the river Sindhu or the people living in the land watered by river Indus. According to historians, This word Hindu was first used by the Persians 
when they came to India through the northwestern passes of Himalaya. It was also used by the Arabs. According to the Encyclopedia of Religion and Ethics, it is mentioned in volume number 6, reference number 699, that the word Hindu is not found in any of the Indian literatures or scriptures before the advent of the Muslims to India. And according to Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru, who wrote the book, Discovery of India, on page number 74 and 75 he writes that the earliest occurrence of this word Hindu can be traced to a tantric of 8th century CE. Means the first time the word Hindu was used was in the 8th century in the Christian era in a tantric in a scripture. And it was used to describe the people. It was never used for describing the followers of a particular religion. Its relationship to religion is of late occurrence. The word Hinduism is derived from the word Hindu and it was first time used by the Englishmen, by the Westerners, by the Britishers to describe a group of beliefs and faiths of the people of India. According to the new Encyclopedia Britannica, volume number 20, reference number 581, it says that the word Hinduism was first used by the British writers in the year 1830 to describe the religion and the belief of the people of India. Since the word Hinduism was first coined by the Englishman, it's an English word, today the Hindu scholars they object and they say that Hinduism is a misnomer. The right word for the religion should be Sanatan Dharam, that is eternal religion or Vedic Dharam, that is the religion of the Vedas. And according to Swami Vivekananda, Hinduism is a misnomer. The followers should be called as Vedantist. That means the followers of the Vedas. So in short, the word Hindu is a geographical definition used for describing the people of India. Its relationship to religion is of late occurrence. The word Hinduism was first used in 1830 by the British writers. It's an English word. And the word Sanatan Dharm, Vedic Dharm, and Vedantist is more appropriate, but these two are nowhere to be found in any Indian scriptures. All these words have come into existence in the past two centuries. Let's understand the definition of the word Islam. Islam comes from the word Salm, which means peace. It's also derived from Salm, which means to submit your will to Almighty God. Islam, in short, means peace obtained by submitting your will to Almighty God. And anyone who submits his will to Almighty God, he is called as a Muslim. And this word, Islam, occurs in various places in the Quran as well as the authentic hadith of Prophet Muhammad including the word Islam occurs in Surah Baqarah chapter number 2 verse number 2 and 8 and the word Muslim occurs in several places in the Quran and the Hadith including Surah Al-Imran chapter 3 verse 64 there is a misconception that Islam is a new religion which came into existence 1400 years back and Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him he was the founder of this religion of Islam in fact Islam is there since time immemorial since man set foot on this earth and Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is not the founder of this religion, but he is the last and final messenger of Almighty God, to whom was revealed the last and final message, the glorious Quran, 1400 years back. In this talk of mine today, I will not be speaking about those similarities between Hinduism and Islam, which is commonly known by most of the followers of both of these religions. I will not be speaking about both the religions say that you should speak the truth, that you should not tell a lie, that you should not be cruel, that you should be kind, that you should not steal. All these are known by the followers of both these religions. In fact, I will be speaking 
about those similarities which are not known commonly by both the followers of these religions. First, we'll discuss the similarities between Hinduism and the pillars of Iman, of faith in Islam. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 177, Allah says that it is not righteousness that you turn your face to the east or west, but it is righteousness that you believe in Allah, you believe in the last day, that you believe in his angels, his books, and his messengers. There's a hadith which is mentioned in Sahih Muslim, volume number one, in the book of Iman, chapter number two, hadith number six, a person approaches the Prophet and asks him, what is Iman? And the Prophet replies, Iman is believing in Allah, in God, in his angels, his books, his meeting, his messengers, in the resurrection, that's life after death, and in Qadr, that is destiny. So basically, there are six pillars of Iman in Islam. The first is believing in God. Second is believing in his angels. Third is believing in his books. Fourth is believing in his messengers. Fifth is believing in resurrection, that is hereafter, that is life after death. And sixth is believing in Qadr, that is destiny. First, we'll discuss what Hinduism has to say about the first pillar, concept of God. If you ask a common Hindu that how many gods does he believe in? Some may say three, some may say ten, some may say hundred, some may say thousand, while others will say thirty-three crores, three hundred and thirty million. But if you ask this question to a learned Hindu who is well versed with the scriptures, he will tell you that the Hindus should actually believe and worship only one almighty God. But the common Hindu, he believes in a philosophy known as pantheism. The common Hindu believes that everything is God. The tree is God, the sun is God, the moon is God, the human being is God, the snake is God. What we Muslims believe that everything is God's, G-O-D with an apostrophe S. Everything belongs to God. The tree belongs to God, the sun belongs to God, the moon belongs to God, the human being belongs to God, the snake belongs to God. So the major difference between the Hindus and the Muslims is the common Hindu says that everything is God. We Muslims say everything is God's. G-O-D with an apostrophe S. The major difference is the apostrophe S. If we can solve this difference of apostrophe S, the Hindus and the Muslims will be united. How do we do it? As the Quran says, Ta'alo ila kalmatin sawa'im barina bainakum. Come to common terms as between us and you. Which is the first term? Allah na'buda illallah. That we believe in only one almighty God. Let us try and understand what the Hindu scriptures have to say about almighty God. It is mentioned in the Chandogya Upanishad. Chapter number 6, section number 2, verse number 1. It says, Ikkam evidityam. It's a Sanskrit quotation which means God is only one without a second. It is mentioned in the Shetashvatar Upanishad. Chapter number 6, verse number 9. Na chasya kasij janita na chadipa. Of him, there are no parents. He has got no lords. Almighty God has got no mother. He has got no father. He has got no master. He has got no superior. It's mentioned in the Shetashvatar Upanishad. Chapter number 4, verse number 19. Of him, there is no likeness. It's further mentioned in the Shetashvatara Upanishad, chapter number 4, verse number 20, that his form cannot be seen. No one can see him with the eyes. Amongst all the Hindu scriptures, the most widely read and the most popular is the Bhagavad Gita. It's mentioned in Bhagavad Gita, chapter number 7, verse number 20. All those whose intelligence has been stolen by material desires, they worship demigods. Which means, all materialistic people, they worship demigods. That is the false gods besides the one true almighty God. It's further mentioned in Bhagavad Gita, chapter number 10, verse number 3. 
that he who knows me as the unborn the beginningless the supreme lord of all the worlds amongst the hindu scriptures the most sacred of the vedas it's mentioned in the yajurved chapter number 32 verse number 3 na tasti pratima asti of him there are no images almighty god has got no images and further says that he is unborn he alone should be worshiped it's mentioned in yajurved chapter number 40 verse number 8 that almighty god is imageless and pure it's mentioned in yajurved chapter number 40 verse number 9 andhatma pravishanti ya asambhuti mupaste andhatma means darkness pravishanti means entering and asambhuti means the natural things like fire water air it means they are entering darkness those who worship the natural things like fire water air and the verse continues they are entering more in darkness those who worship the created things like table chair idol etc who says that yajurved chapter number 40 verse number 9 it's further mentioned in the atharva ved book number 20 hymn number 58 verse number 3 dev maha asi verily great is almighty god and amongst the hindu scriptures the most sacred are the rigved it is mentioned in rigved book number 1 hymn number 164 verse number 46 the shloka which were recited by the respected pandits it says ekam sat vipra bahuda avadante ekam sat vipra bahuda vidante which means truth is one god is one sages call him by various names and the same message repeated in rigved book number 10 hymn number 114 verse number 5 that god is one but sages call him by a variety of names and in rigved alone in book number 2 hymn number 1 there are no less than 33 different attributes given to almighty god many of which were recited by the respected pundits one amongst them in rigved book number two hymn number one verse number three is brahma if you translate brahma into english it means the creator if you translate into arabic it means khalik we muslims have got no objection if someone calls almighty god as khalik or the creator or brahma but if someone says brahma is almighty god who has got four heads and on each head is a crown we muslims take strong exception to it moreover you are going against chetash vatar upanishad chapter number four verse number 19 which says na tasya pratima asti of him there is no likeness another attribute given in rigved book number two hymn number one verse number three is vishnu if you translate vishnu into English it means the sustainer it means the cherisher if you translate into Arabic it is somewhat similar to Rab we Muslims have got no objection if someone says Almighty God is Rab or Vishnu or sustainer or cherisher but if someone says Vishnu is Almighty God who has got four hands one of his right hand is the disc is the chakra the other hand he has the conch he's traveling on the bird by the name of garuda or reclining on a couch of snakes we muslims take strong objection to it moreover you are going against yajurved chapter number 32 verse number 3 which says na tasipati asti of him there are no images if you read rigved all these descriptions are not given the attributes are given that almighty god is creator he's sustainer he's cherisher we have no objection with attribute but these images are not given because it is mentioned in the Vedas that Almighty God has got no images. It's further mentioned in the Gved, book number 8, hymn number 1, verse number 1, Ma Chidanadi Sansad. Ma Chidanadi Sansad, which means do not worship anyone except the one God. It's mentioned in the Gved, book number 6, hymn number 45. Verse number 16. Ya ik it mushtihi. Praise him alone, the one true God. And the Brahma Sutra of the Vedanta is 
एक कम ब्रह्म द्वितिया नास्ते नहना नास्ते किंचन विच मीन्स भगवान एक ही है दूसरा नहीं है नहीं है नहीं है जरा भी नहीं है देर इज ओनली वन गॉड नॉट अ सेकेंड नॉट एट ऑल नॉट एट ऑल नॉट इन द लीस्ट बिट सो इफ वी रीड द हिंदू स्क्रिप्चर्स वी अंडरस्टैंड द कॉन्सेप्ट ऑफ गॉड इन हिंदुइज्म लेट्स ट्राइन अंडरस्टैंड द कॉन्सेप्ट ऑफ गॉड इन इस्लाम The best reply any Muslim can give you regarding the concept of God in Islam is quote to you Surah Ikhlas, chapter number one hundred and twelve, verse number one to four, which says, "Qul huwa Allah ahad." Say He is Allah one and only, Allah who samad, Allah the absolute and eternal. Lam yalid, walam yulad. He begets not, nor is begotten. Walam yakul lahu kufwan ahad, and there is nothing like Him. This is a four line definition. of almighty god given in the glorious quran in surah ikhlas which is the same as which was mentioned in the hindu scriptures the first is qul huwa allahu ahad say he is allah one and only same as the chandogya upanishad chapter number 6 section number 2 verse number 1 which says ikam evidityam god is only one without a second the second was allahu samad allah the absolute and eternal Same as Bhagavad Gita, chapter number ten, verse number three, which says that He is the Lord of all the worlds. Verse number three, Lam yalid, walam yulad. He begets not, nor is begotten. Same as Shetash Patar Upanishad, chapter number six, verse number nine, which says, Na chasya kafij janita na chadipa, which means. Almighty God has got no parents. He has got no lords. He has got no mother. He has got no father. And the last is, "Walam yekul lahu kufwan ad." There is nothing like him. Same as mentioned in the Shetash Patar Upanishad, chapter number four, verse number nineteen, as well as the Ajurved, chapter number thirty-two, verse number three, which says, "Na tasse pati ma asti." Of him, there is no likeness. He has got no images. The definition of Almighty God given in Quran and the Hindu Scripture is exactly the same. This is the touchstone of theology. Surah Khlas and what's quoted from the Hindu Scriptures is the touchstone of theology. If anyone says that so and so candidate is God, you put him to the test of Surah Khlas. If that candidate passes the test, he is the true Almighty God. If he doesn't, he is not a true God. For example. Some people say that Bhagwan Rajnish, he is Almighty God. There was a Hindu brother of ours during question answer time once he said that if Hindus don't agree, Bhagwan Rajnish is God. I know that. I never said that Hindus say Bhagwan Rajnish is God. I said some people say that Bhagwan Rajnish is God. I've read the Hindu scriptures. Nowhere do the Hindu scriptures say that Bhagwan Rajnish is God. But there are many people who have converted from different religions, and now they say that Bhagwan Rajnish is God. Let us put Bhagwan Rajnish to the test of Surah Class and the test of the Hindu Scriptures. The first is Pul Hu Allah Wad. Say it Allah and only. Ek kam evidityam. There is only one God without a second. Is Rajnish one and only? Is he the only man who has claimed divinity? There are many who have claimed divinity, especially in this country of ours. There are thousands of men who have claimed divinity. He is not the only one. But a Rajnish Bhakti will say, No, he is unique. He is the only one. Let's go to the next test. Allah Hu Samad, Allah, the absolute and eternal. Was Rajnish absolute and eternal? We know from his biography that he was suffering from asthma, from diabetes, from chronic backache. Imagine Almighty God suffering from asthma, from diabetes, from chronic backache. Third test is Lam Yalid, Palam Yulad. He begets not, nor is begotten. Same as Chandogya Upanishad, chapter number six, section number two, verse number one. Na chasya kasij janita na chadipa. Of him there are no parents, no mother, no father. We know Rajnish had a father and mother. He was born in the state of Madhya Pradesh. In 1981 he goes to America and takes thousands of Americans for a ride. And in the state of Oregon. He starts his town known as Rajneeshpuram. Later on, the American government they arrest him and they put him behind bars. And he claims 
that the American government gave me slow poisoning in the jail. Imagine Almighty God being slow poisoned. And later on in 1985, the American government, they kick him out of the country, he comes back to India, and in the city of Pune, he restarts his center, which is today known as the Osho Commune. And if you go to Pune and visit the center of the Osho Commune, it is mentioned on his tombstone, Bhagwan Rajnish, Osho Rajnish, never born, never died, but visited the earth from the 11th of December 1931 to the 19th of January 1990. Never born, never died, but visited the earth from the 11th of December 1931 to the 19th of January 1990. Never born, never died. They forgot to mention on his tombstone that he was not given visas to 21 different countries of the world. Imagine Almighty God coming in this world to visit the world and he requires visas to visit different countries. And the Archbishop of Greece said, if you don't remove Rajneesh out of this country, we'll burn his house and the house of his disciples. And the last test, Walam Yakullahu Kufwan Ahad, there's nothing like him, is so stringent that no one besides the true Almighty God can pass. The moment you can compare God to anyone in this world, in this universe, he is not God. Walam Yakullahu Kufwan Ahad. We know Rajneesh, he was a human being like us, had two eyes, one nose, two hands, two legs, had a white beard. The moment you can compare God to anything in this world, He is not God. For example, if someone says that Almighty God is a thousand times stronger than Arnold Schwarzenegger. You might have heard the name of Arnold Schwarzenegger. The person who got the title, Mr. Universe, Mr. World, the strongest man in the world, the strongest man in the universe. If someone says that Almighty God is a thousand times stronger than Arnold Schwarzenegger, the moment you can compare God to anyone, whether it be Arnold Schwarzenegger, whether it be Dara Singh or whether it be King Kong, whether it be a thousand times or whether it be a million times, the moment you can compare God to anything in this world, He is not God. There is nothing like Him. My request is to my dear brothers and sisters, whichever God you are worshipping, put them to the test of Surya class and the test of the Hindu scriptures. If they pass the test, they are true Almighty God. If they fail, they are not. Otherwise, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, in Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 110, the ayat which was recited by the Qari, Qulidullah Abidur Rahman, Ayamatadu, Falal Asma al Husna. Say call upon him by Allah or by Rahman. By whichever name you call upon him, to him belongs the most beautiful name. You can call Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by any name, but it should be a beautiful name. It should not conjure up a mental picture. And there are no less than 99 different attributes given to Almighty God in the glorious Quran. Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, Al-Hakim, most gracious, most merciful, most wise, no less than 99. And the crowning one is Allah. Why do we Muslims prefer calling Allah by the Arabic word Allah instead of the English word God? Because a person cannot play mischief with the Arabic word Allah as you can do with the English word God. For example, if you add S to God, it becomes God's. That's plural of God. There's nothing like plural Allah. Kul hu Allahu ahad. Say he's Allah one and only. If you add D-E-S-S to God, it becomes Goddess, meaning a female God. There's nothing like male Allah or female Allah. Allah has got no gender. He is unique. If you add father to God, it becomes Godfather. He's my Godfather. He's my guardian. There's nothing like Allah Father or Allah by Islam. If you add mother to God, it becomes Godmother. There's nothing like Allah Ammi or Allah Mother in Islam. Allah is a unique word. If you add tin before God, it becomes tin God, meaning fake God. There's nothing like tin Allah in Islam. That's the reason we Muslims, we prefer calling Allah by the Arabic word Allah instead of the English word God. But if there are some Muslims who, while speaking with the non Muslims about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, these non Muslims may not know the concept of Allah. So if they use the word God instead of Allah, like how I'm doing today, there's no problem. But I'd like to remind that God is not the appropriate translation of the Arabic word Allah. 
And this word Allah is mentioned in all the sacred scriptures of the major world religion, including Hinduism. It's mentioned in Rig Ved, book number two, hymn number one, verse number 11. He's referred as Ilah or Allah, meaning God. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is also mentioned by name in Rig Ved, book number three, hymn number 30, verse number 10, as well as Rig Ved, book number nine, hymn number 67, verse number 30. He has been mentioned by name as Allah in several verses of the Vedas. Let's try and understand the second pillar of Iman, that is the angels. As far as Hinduism is concerned, there is no particular concept of angels in Hinduism, but Hinduism, they have certain superhuman beings which do work which a normal human being can't do. In Islam, angels are created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Almighty God. And they are created from light. They do not have a free will of their own. They obey all the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they have been appointed certain duties. For example, Archangel Gabriel, he has been appointed to get the revelations from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the messengers of Almighty God. Let's discuss the third pillar of Iman, that is the books. First, we'll discuss the books in Hinduism. The books in Hinduism are divided into two broad categories, the Shrutis and the Smritis. The Shruti means something which is revealed, which is heard, which is perceived, which is understood. The Shrutis, by the Hindu scholars, they are considered to be of divine origin, to be the word of God. And they are the most superior. They are divided into the Vedas and the Upanishads. The word Veda is the